Vectors are basic elements of uh, continuum mechanical theories, and so I'd like to say a little bit about what a vector is, and I'm going to start with an abstract uh, setting, and then we'll move into something a little bit more concrete, and then we'll close with a few uh, aspects of definitions and terminology that you may hear or read occasionally. So a vector is, uh, one way of defining it is a vector is an element of a set V, and V is called a vector space, okay? so. So you have a set, uh, and it contains certain elements, and those elements we call vectors. And to really technically call them vectors, the set V and the vectors that are elements of V need to satisfy certain properties. So uh, the first property is that if you take any two elements of the set and we add them together, you can add them together in the opposite order, and you will still have the same element of the, of the set V. So it's closed under addition, and it's commutative or addition is commutative. Uh, the second property is that addition is associative, so you can add two vectors and add a third one to it, or you can add the second two vectors together and then add the first one, and you should get the same result. So that's the second main property that you have to satisfy. And the third property that you have to have is that there has to be a zero element, So, and we'll denote it with the letter O with an under bar under it, a little wiggle. And it has a property that if you add the zero element to any other element of the vector space, you get back the original vector. So the standard meaning of zero, as you're used to it. And the last property that we need to have is that there has to be an inverse element in the set V. And that means that for every vector A, there, is, there exists a vector minus A, such that if you add A to minus A, that you get back the zero element. So those are the basic properties of, of a vector space. So this is a pretty abstract definition, but uh, that's what's required mathematically. Uh, now, we additionally, we work with real vector spaces in continuum mechanics usually. So if we have scalars alpha and beta, which are real numbers, then if we multiply a scalar times a vector, it should still be a vector. So we have that definition. Or, the next one is that if we multiply a vector by one, the number one that is, that we get back the original vector. We also have the property that if we're multiplying a vector by a scalar and then by another scalar, it doesn't matter if we multiply the scalars together first and then multiply into the vector or do it one at a time. So again, this is kind of like the associative rule that we have for the addition. And then the last thing that we need to have is a distributive rule. And there's two aspects to this. One is that multiplication by scalars, alpha, distributes across addition of vectors. So we end up with that. And lastly, that multiplication by the sum of two scalars into a vector is equal to multiplying the scalars individually into the vector. And that is a typo there. So this B here should be NA. Okay, so those are the main properties of a vector space. So relatively abstract, but it comports very well with what we know. So, so these rules really apply to one's usual experience with vectors. So, and that is usually thinking of a directed line segment. So if we add two vectors A and B together, we get a third vector C. It's still a directed line segment, for example. Uh, so nothing unusual there. Uh, now, just as a concrete example, suppose I have a body and here, and I push an indenter into that body, it's going to move, and to each point there'll be a displacement, and it'll have a magnitude and a direction, so we'll have a displacement vector at every point in the body. And just as a bit of terminology, the displacement at any point x in the body uh, will, will be u of x, and taken together we'll call this a vector field. So to every point in space or in the body, there is a displacement vector. We call that a vector field. Uh, one super important thing about vectors is that we usually write them with respect to a basis. So I, if I have a basis uh, E1, E2, E3, then I can decompose the vector into that basis, and I can have A1, E1, A2, E2, A3, E3. And 
these coefficients, a1, a2, and a3, those are called the components of a in the EI basis. Uh, some things got messed up here. Let's just kind of fix that up right there. So, so those are the components of a in the EI basis. They're just the projections of a onto the axes or the directions defined by the unit vectors e1, e2, and e3. And so, and it's really important to note that the components are basis dependent. So if I pick a different basis, say e1 prime, e2 prime, e3 prime, I'll get different components. The vector is the same, it's a physical quantity, but the components themselves depend on the basis. So that's something that you impose on the problem. Uh, just as, as a point that of uh, convention that we will always hold to is that the, the basis vectors EI will always be unit in length. So their norm will always be taken equal to one. And the basis vectors themselves, if you take the dot product between them, they'll always be equal to delta IJ, which is called the Kronecker delta. And that has the property that if I is not equal to J, you get zero. And if I equals J, you get one. So E1 dot E1 gives you one, but E1 dot E2 will give you zero. So they're orthogonal to each other. So we're, we'll always use uh, orthonormal uh, basis vectors. So ortho, meaning they're orthogonal, normal mean they have unit length. Okay, so that, that'll be our usual setup here. Uh, one, one important sort of manipulation uh, that one should know about is the component extraction rule. So if I take a vector A and I take its dot product with any basis vector EI, so I can be one, two, or three, then that will give me the component in that direction. So this is the component extraction rule. And really what you have here, EI dot A is just the projection of A onto EI. So just so as a diagram here, so if I have the vector A here uh, and I have the unit vector EI, I compute the orthogonal projection of A onto EI and that gives me the component AI. It's important to note in all this that the norm of EI is equal to one if you want it to actually numerically be the projection, okay? Uh, the other thing to note is that if, if you'd like to know the length of A, so the norm of A, then that's the square root of the dot product of A with itself. So that's the length or the magnitude of A. And lastly, don't forget that the basis vectors here have to be or orthonormal. So EI dot EJ is equal to delta IJ. And then all of this holds true. If you don't have that, you, you can do it, but uh, you have to take a few other things into consideration to get the right results always. Okay, so this is, this is really a quick uh, summary of, of some properties of vectors and some of the ways in which we manipulate them. Uh, I'd like to close with just a bit of formality here and so some extra terminology. So sometimes one will see the phrase norm vector space, a norm vector space, and a norm vector space is just simply a vector space with an operation called a norm. And a norm is an operation that simply takes to every vector in the vector space and assigns to it a number. And in our, in our usual situation, it's the length of that vector, okay? And formally, the definition follows us in, in this way, is that the, the norm needs to be a non-negative number, and it should only be zero if you're taking the norm of the zero element. The other property that you have to have is that if you take the norm of a scalar times a vector, it's equal to the absolute value of the scalar times the norm of the vector. And also you have to have something known as the triangle inequality. So the norm of A plus B is less than the norm of A plus B. So that's known as the triangle inequality. And it's pretty easy to see that's going to be true in the usual setting. If I add A plus B, it's going to give me a vector C. So C is A plus B. And it's pretty clear to see from the diagram that the length of C is going to be less than the length of A plus the length of B. So that, that's a standard property of a norm. But I just listed out this is the formal definition of what a norm space is. So sometimes you see that written down, and so it's good to know what the formal definition is. 
Um, there is one other formal definition that's nice to know. Uh, that's something called an inner product space. And an inner product space is simply a vector space with an inner product. And so inner product, you can just think dot product. That's just a synonym. People usually don't talk about dot product spaces, so that's why I called it an inner product space. And an inner product is just simply an operation that takes two vectors in the vector space and assigns to it a number. And the way it does it, it has to satisfy certain properties. Uh, the first one is a distributive property. So if I take two vectors A and B and I dot them with the third vector C, I could simply take the individual dot products and then add the numbers together. The second property that I had to have is that if I take the dot product of a scalar times a vector with another vector, I could take the dot product first and then multiply by the scalar. So there's a kind of associative rule here that's at play. The third property is that if I take the dot product of a vector with itself, so a dotted with a, then that has to be non-negative. And it can only be zero if a is the zero vector. So that's the third property. Uh, usually people uh, in the types of problems that we deal with, we deal with vector spaces that are both inner product spaces and, and norm spaces. And the norm that we use is what's known as the natural norm, meaning that it is the square root of the dot product of a vector with itself.